What's cracking, big dose? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to bunk bed breakdowns. If you are watching on the Big Dogs channel, make sure you are subscribed to the Bunk Bed Breakdowns YouTube channel as well as their podcast. If you want the audio feed of this, this is the Dynasty Show that we are putting out weekly on the Big Dogs channel. Over the next month or so, for the month of August, we will be doing some redraft focused content. So I know a lot of y'all have your season long drafts coming up. We've been talking dynasty for like five or six months now, but, but, but it's almost draft season for this year. So we want to make sure we are injecting you with some redraft stuff today. We're doing some hot takes, some bold predictions, but not our bold predictions. We gathered, what was it? 12 or 15 different bold predictions from the discord channel. And uh, we're going to go through them. Some of our favorite ones, we are going to scale it one to 10. One being that we don't even think they're hot takes. We don't think they're bold predictions. We agree with them. 10 being that they're just fucking outrageous and uh, we probably shouldn't have included them to begin with. But we're going to we're gonna pick a number one to 10, each of us, and we're kind of uh, debate the hot, the hot takes, the bold predictions that we have on the list today. Uh, make sure that you drop any bold predictions you got for the 2020 fantasy season. I believe most of these bold predictions are, I mean, they're really not going to go too much further than the 2020 season, but I guess they kind of, you know, uh, depend on what you want to do dynasty with what we talk about here analysis wise, regardless, y'all get the point. We are back. We are bike. Noah is no longer bright red. He has started to simmer <laughs> down. The tan is settling in. How are we doing boys? Doing all right. My nose is peeling like crazy. So I try to clean it up before <laughs> we recorded. Hopefully my camera isn't good enough quality to capture that. <laughs> yeah, man, it's lit out here. Had a, had a good morning. Uh, now I'm ready to just, you know, dish out some big facts, man, or some bold facts, I guess. Hell yeah, let's talk that talk. Hit the intro, baby. All right. First up from user Daniel. Is this, I don't know if this is Danny boy, but if it is, uh, shout out to him. It can't but, be. Uh, it can't be because it's not Cowboys related. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> no way. Josh Allen is seen as the next Trubisky and is drafted outside of the top twenty dynasty QBs in twenty twenty one. To me, this is a fact. It's not even a bold prediction. Uh, what about you guys? Uh, I'm gonna give this a a rating of uh, six and a half. I think that while Josh Allen, a lot of the traits and the characteristics are there to add up for him being the next Trubisky, just in terms of throwing accuracy. The situations that them two are in were in like polar opposites because Trubisky, I mean, he brought less to the table than whatever they put around him, but what they put around him was also the table was foodless. So when you look at Josh Allen, they've been building around him for a while now. They have a, an underrated offensive line. They got Stephon Diggs. They have John Brown. They've got a lot of young weapons that I think they're building around. So when I look at fantasy quarterbacks, I think most of them are going to be as good as the surrounding talent uh, around them. I think it gives them enough floor when you have weapons around you because you start to game plan around those weapons rather than putting the team on the quarterback's bike side and letting him run with it. But when you have the weapons like Stephon Diggs, you can write up a lot of plays. You can have the, uh, the ground heavy game. So I don't see anyone failing as spectacularly as Trubisky did. Um, I think that's, it's probably too bold. I don't think he'll finish outside of the top 20 quarterbacks or be drafted outside. I mean, he might take a step back if he, if he's really wildly inaccurate this year, then people will continue to project that into the future and project his downfall to come a lot quicker than we expected. But I think he'll be fine running wise. I think he'll still be drafted maybe inside like the top 12 or 15, as opposed to like top seven or eight this year. Um, but I, I don't think the fall off will be that high. Yeah. I'm right there with Nick and a lot of people are comparing him to like a Blake Bortles type. The main difference I would say is it took Blake Bortles like three to four years to make it to the playoffs. And that was in 2017 when he was carried by that like historically great defense. Josh Allen does have a good defense, but it only took him two years to go into the playoffs. I believe they were like 10 and six. And now, as Nick said, like you see them completely building around him, bringing in Stephon Diggs, upgrading the offensive line. And he was drafted like seventh overall, and he was not expected to be a day one starter. He was more of a project. And the fact that from year one to year two, he's taken as big of a leap as he has, although he hasn't been like fantastic accuracy wise, like his touchdown percentage is up, his interception percentage is down, his completion is up. And just having weapons around him, I think, like, even adding a Zach Moss, somebody who can, like, maybe add a little longevity, taking away those goal line carries from him inside the five-yard line, where we saw, like, a Patrick Mahomes get hurt last year. I think that he has enough longevity in this league to be taken well within the top 20 dynasty quarterbacks. Because, like, even a guy like Jameis Winston this past season, like, 
we knew he wasn't going – he didn't have the longest leash, right, because he's a dumbass quarterback, even though he's good for fantasy. And because of that alone, he was picked well within the top 20 dynasty quarterbacks heading into 2019. He obviously lost his job. So I still think people will have uh, enough faith in Josh Allen to pick him, like as Nick said, top 12, top 15 quarterback, even if he does have a down season with Stephon Diggs in his first year in Buffalo. So I'd rate this around uh, a 7 or 8 because I wouldn't rate it a 10 because I could kind of see it happening with a Mitchell Trubisky type. But I also think the Bears are just kind of pissed that they passed up on Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. Now they see this idiot like being an absolute buffoon out there every week. So I think that kind of plays into it as well. Yeah, I'm going to give this a three or a four because I think it's actually more likely to happen than not. Um, I think the Blake Bortle comparison is actually a pretty good one. Given their situation, I think both kind of rode their defense um, to where they are. And, you know, if we look at the stats, I mean, Blake Bortle is actually a better passer than Josh Allen was, which is crazy to see and uh, crazy to say, but that's that's just a fact. And I think, I think like going forward, like, is he going to be a Trubisky? Is he going to take one more year? Is going to take two more years? He's in That's the why I think, I think the top 20, like outside of the top 20, if it does happen, it'll, it probably won't be next offseason. It'll be the Yeah, I, I, I could see that. But also just looking at the list of the people in the top, uh, let me call it top 15, these are the people that I, I feel like could easily kind of leap him. Um, right now, I have him at quarterback 12. I think he's being drafted like quarterback eight or something like that. Yeah. Um, but you got like Joe Burrow and Tua Tagovailoa. Uh, you got Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones. If Daniel Jones takes that next step, um, if Jared Goff kind of bounces back, you know you got Matthew Stafford, Ryan Tannehill, Kirk Cousins, who I think are just criminally underrated uh, every single year. So that's about 16 quarterbacks I could kind of see going ahead of him, right? And then you have some of like the dark horse guys uh, down below, but also you have like Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields coming in next class. You got Trey Lance. That's like three quarterbacks right there. Um, so like it, there isn't really that much margin of error. It sounds crazy. Like when we say like, outside the top 20, it makes him sound like he's like super trash, but I think, I, I think, I think what the, the Delta might be here is like, yeah, you have the new one, the new young quarterbacks coming in, but we also have a bunch of guys on that, on the cusp, right? Like you have the Rogers is the Matt Ryan's who are like one, one bad year away from like floating into that quarterback 21 to 25 range. And that's where yeah, I yeah. get dicey, you know? Yeah, I'm not even counting them. Uh, so okay. I'm only counting like the the young guys, like Jared. Goff. I just know they're going inside the top twenty right now. Yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, Rogers. The only, <laughs> I mean, the only people drafted Rogers inside the top twelve are boomers. So we don't even talk about that. Um, <laughs> hey, don't call Richie a boomer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then yeah, like I said, you got some dark horse guys down below. But yeah, I, I'm I'm saying like I could easily see him like float into that like fifteen to eighteen range, and then like if he like kind of underperforms this year, if a rushing kind of comes down. I could see him getting it bumped out, but like like you said, it's kind of fluid in that range, so it's tough to say. So I, I'm giving him a, th- I'm giving this like a three or four rating. Uh, you guys okay. giving it six or so? Uh, I went but- six and a half. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to run through these a little more quickly, otherwise it's gonna yeah. be a three hour fucking <laughs> yeah. Lord of the Rings featured film. All right. From from prime time, Kareem Hunt becomes the RB one in Cleveland, and they trade Chubb. This is an eleven out of ten. There <laughs> yeah. there is absolutely no chance the Cleveland Browns are. I mean, listen, there's like multiple parts. Of, I don't know which is the more ridiculous part of the statement, but uh, Kareem Hunt becomes the RB one in Cleveland. Chubb's probably top two best pure runners in the NFL. They have him on the rookie contract. They have no incentive to trade him. Yeah, and Kareem Hunt's got one year left. So what are they gonna do? Trade Chubb and then have to pay Kareem Hunt? Like their yeah, front office is dumb, but I hope they're not that dumb to do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, we can I'm, just move on with that, Mike. Yeah, I don't even. Let's move on. I don't think Daddy <laughs> Flex guy. This one, yeah. Uh, Daddy Flex guy. Jerry Judy outproduces Cortland Sutton in full PPR in 2020. Uh, Mike, I, I thought you made a really good thread or, or point on Twitter the other day with with Cortland Sutton. Like, if you're investing into Cortland Sutton, it's because you think he's an absolute baller and he's going to be the one. You're not. You're not investing in Cortland Sutton at this point because you think like Drew Locke is ready to take. <laughs> yeah. You're like yeah. Cortland Sutton is an elite ball commander. Like he's yeah. going to be the one that actually carries Drew Locke and the team. And I, I think he's good enough to do that. And uh, he's the only one that's good enough to do that right now in the NFL. So I see no chance that Jerry Judy is good enough, one, to like command the targets over Sutton and also be the one who raises Drew Locke's game. So it's Cortland Sutton's game or it's nobody's. That's the way I'm yeah. looking at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with you. So like, so like eight and a half, nine for me. Yeah, I, I'm, giving this, I'm giving this a nine and a half just because I think Cortland Sutton is baller. He's done everything that we want to see someone his age and his progression and his profile do. And, you know, granted, everyone loves Judy and, you know, he's, the, he's that dude or whatever. But I don't, I don't see Judy ever overtaking Cortland Sutton. I'm not talking about this year. I'm talking about as long as they are both in Denver, this is going to be the Cortland Sutton show. And Judy may be productive and he may be good, but he's going to be the 1B to Cortland Sutton's 1A always. And, and I'm buying the talent of Sutton. Uh, I, I know, you know, people know that I'm not a big fan of Locke. So I think, you know, if someone produces, it's going to be Sutton creating for 
himself and not because Locke is some some sort of stud. But you know, I could he could he could do well, and if if Locke is better than we thought, even even better for Cortland Sutton. Yeah, I have this as a nine as well. Like as you guys said, he caught what eleven hundred yards and like eight touchdowns from Brandon Allen, Joe Flacco, Drew Locke last year. Like none of those guys should be NFL quarterbacks, including Drew Locke. So you guys in the comments, I think he's good. Tone it down. He kind of stinks. And Jerry Judy throughout his entire career has played with like really good quarterbacks at Alabama. That's not to say he's not going to be good in the NFL because I think he is probably the most pro ready receiver in this class. But with COVID happening and just with how dominant Cortland Sutton was last year, taking that major like year one to year two jump and people being like, oh, he can't separate. <clears throat> it turns out when you're six, four and you can jump through the roof, you don't really have to separate all that much because you're still a dominant receiver as he's been throughout his entire career through college and so far in the NFL. So I put this at a nine just because I see Cortland Sutton as like a fringy wide receiver one because even last year in one of the most unlikely situations to produce, he did it. So I think just adding more weapons and going back to Nick's point that he brings up all the time, like the AFC West is competing with the Kansas City Chiefs. Although they brought in more weapons, they're probably going to throw a lot more because they have to compete with one of the most high-powered, most potent offenses in the league in Kansas City in their division. So I still see him as like a top 12 to 15 guy. And Jerry Judy could kind of struggle at the gate. Yeah, um, so we're all pretty – way the fuck off board on that one that <laughs> yeah. guy. all right yeah. bush ronald jones is a top three round startup pick this time next year after finishing 2020 as a top 15 running back i think you know i like this this bold prediction in the fact that it's not outrageous but it's probably more unlikely to happen there's like multiple parts to this right he finished as a top 15 running back i think the path is absolutely clear like he showed enough to me last year that i think he can be the rb1 in tampa here and being the rb1 in tampa that that's what becomes a question I think is like is that enough to get you into that top 15 range and I've actually been buying a little bit more and more into Ronald Jones I've been grabbing in a lot of startup leagues this summer in like the ninth or tenth round to someone who is super young man he's he's younger than Keyshawn Vaughn he's younger than some of these rookies and second year backs you have to remember he was the youngest running back in the class that he came in with and when you're like a 21 year old kid 20 year old kid I think he was actually 20 when he came in coming out of USC, like, you're probably not a professional. You're not ready to, like, take that step into the NFL. You're partying in Southern California for fucking two, three years, whatever you were doing. And then you step into the NFL, and they expect you to be on point with your training, on point with everything. Like, that wasn't the case for Rojo. The fact – if he was 25 at this point, I would say this is, you know, I have no faith in him dynasty-wise. But the fact that he's had a couple years to, to, to understand what it takes to make it in the NFL, and he's still young, and he's still younger than a lot of these running backs – Makes me hopeful. I think he showed enough last year that because this offseason is going to be so shortened, Keyshawn Vaughn won't be able to get enough momentum to take over Ronald Jones in the summer and probably not for the first half of the season. If Ronald Jones goes out there with the starting job, which I assume he will have in the beginning, you know, it's his job to lose is the way I look at it. I think he was good enough in, in the passing game where we didn't think he was that good last year. Like 31 receptions, not a lot, but for 310 yards, like that's good. 10 yards per reception, man. That, that shows some pretty good explosion uh, through the air. So I'm buying into Ronald Jones. I think top 15 is absolutely realistic. Top three round startup pick next year. I mean, it won't be me, but I, I could see it happening if he comes off a strong year. Yeah, I think the top 15 this year is around like a five or six. I don't think that's too bold at all. As far as the top three startup round pick next year, I'd put that around like, a seven or eight, because even if Keyshawn Vaughn doesn't do too well this year, I think there will be enough hype like in next offseason where people looking up his stats in college and saying he's a better pass catcher than Ronald Jones, he's a better mm -hmm. pass blocker, he's a better goal line back. I think that alone will move him outside like the top 15 to 18 running backs, which is kind of what you have to be to be a top three round startup pick. But, you know, I'm not as big, as big of a fan as Ronald of Ronald Jones as Nick is, but I could totally see if he goes out and he puts up like 1,000 to 1,200 yards next season. season there's going to be a ton of hype about him because coming out of college, he was that guy who was seen as like a breakaway runner, like a Jamal Charles type, even though he can't catch passes anywhere near as good as Jamal Charles. And just being part of that Bucks offense in a division that just gives up points week in and week out, like 40 burgers, 50 burgers every single week, I could definitely see him rising up draft boards in 2021. Yeah, I, I'm going to give this a uh, 7 out of 10 because yeah, my like, number would have been five and a half by the way yeah I, I like the i like the prediction uh, a little bit uh but i will say I, I, i'm like struggling with the with the last part like you know is like him becoming a third round starter pick because again i'm always thinking about like what that next class coming in is like right you got Etienne, you got um you know harris Najee harris you got like kenneth Gainswell, you got triple Cuba, Hubbard, all these yeah, guys yeah. Uh, that are also going to be kind of riding that hype wave uh, in terms of value so i could see him producing rb15 numbers this year but i don't i don't know if i could see him getting an rb15 like top three round valuation so that's where i'm struggling yeah so we're in we're kind of in between there not too hot not too bold but definitely not 
against it. So that was a good one, Bush. Nicholas, Antonio Gibson will be the RB1 for the Washington football team. Fucking too much swag with that name, man. I want to <laughs> – <laughs> are the did you guys see the jerseys that they're doing is yeah, it just they look, they they look so nice. dope they're like the best jerseys and i love the they chargers nice. jerseys, but I think does it say them. football team on it or just washington i just saw the helmets and the colors i don't know if it says football team yeah it didn't Damn. say anything. they're just clean like just clean jerseys. if yeah. they said football team i'd get a terry <laughs> <laughs> uh, and be the next kamara so antonio gibson will be the rb1 for the washington football team and be the next kamara um i mean someone else start with this yeah, the next uh, Kamara, I'm going to put that as a one because I think he's better than Alvin Kamara right now. <laughs> as far as the RB1 for the Washington football team, man, that's like an eight or a nine. Not because I don't think he's good enough, but I'm not sure that he's going to get anywhere near the workload. Like, do they still have J.D. McKissick and, like, Peyton Barber and all those guys there? Like, they have so many running backs. They lost Chris Thompson, but I don't think it really matters. The only way I see him becoming the RB1 there is for everybody in front of him to get hurt, which is certainly realistic for Washington if that's going to happen. But – uh, I, I do believe in the talent. Mike and I loved him going into the draft. And the fact that he landed at Washington kind of left a bad taste in our mouth. But we kind of tried to spin zone it into a good thing. But <laughs> I think overall, it's like it's an eight or a nine. I just think he's more of like they'll view him as more of a gadget player than a true running back in the league. And for him to become Alvin Kamara, he needs like an offensive mind like Sean Payton for that to happen. And I'm not so sure Ron Rivera can be mentioned in the same sentence as him. Yeah, yeah. I think that next Kamara part, I'm going to punt that as like a like 11 out of 10 because I think that's a bit too wild. Uh, but let me just talk about the RB1 on the Washington football team. I mean, I could, I could see a path to him getting there, but as long as – I think as long as Geis is healthy, he'll probably lead the team in rushing yards. So I guess it depends on – if he's talking about scoring, like maybe Gibson gets there uh, with the passing work just because there isn't that many weapons there. But, you know, Kamara got to be in Kamara, who, first of all, who's – a freaking unicorn so i don't try and compare anyone to alvin kamara ever uh but he also had like sean payton like you said but in addition to that he has drew Brees. he had you know the top offensive line in the nfl just a lot of different factors that go into that like for running back production so as much as we love gibson the talent the situation is nowhere near on the same level as uh, alvin kamara uh but with regards to the other running backs i think they're gonna get some of them gonna get cut like peyton barber and like I, I, I like oh, I'm almost certain that like they're about to start doing eat. their Chicago Bears yeah. tight end fucking yeah they're gonna start, start cutting these trimming the fat players. real quick yeah, yeah that's they keep like 80 players now though with COVID they might just keep all of them 81 yeah but no I think that was the same with like that's normal training camp you have uh whatever it is and you cut down to 53 by game time I'm not really sure what the roster is fucking made up but most of those guys won't matter once the game times actually come around so I mean my take on it most I can't get behind any of the Antonio Gibson like bold prediction takes this summer because they're just like there's nothing to them. They're just straight projection. Like nothing we've heard is like Antonio Gibson's our guy. He's the one who's going to carry the rock, you know. So it's just like you have no actual reason to saying that behind his athletic hype. So I don't I I don't see a path to it happening. The Kamara part is just fucking outrageous, irresponsible <laughs> for us to even bring up on the channel. Uh, so. Dally Boy, 12. Henry Ruggs pulls a full cheetah and accounts for 900 plus yards and 12 all purpose touchdowns. I'd have to put up the meme where, like, you had me in the first half and then you know, <laughs> took it, yeah. whatever that fucking meme was. I'm, I'm on board. I'm, like, dude, I'm really getting higher on Henry Ruggs with the 900 plus yards. I think that's like, I think that's a bold mark, but I don't think it's unreachable. I think the 12 all purpose touchdowns is out of control. Like, there's no reason he's going <laughs> to get I think he was talking about on your Madden franchise. So I put that out of one. Dude, I get that in like a game. Week one, Henry <laughs> Ruggs is so fucking good in Madden. It's unbelievable. We're in like year three by, right now. He's 99, superstar, X fucking factor. It's ridiculous. 900 yards. Uh, okay, so I'm going to put this overall prediction at like a nine. nine. I'm going to put the 900 yards at like a seven and a half to a 7.75 in that range. Um, I think, yeah, I like, I'm, I'm really excited to see how Gruden utilizes rugs. You don't pick a guy that early and not have a plan. Doesn't mean it's going to be a successful plan, but you know, <laughs> they're going to have a plan in mind for how they want to use him. And he's a guy that works really well by the line of scrimmage. So it's not going to be something where he needs so much time and prep to understand how to fucking take one step and then turn and get the ball and then run with it. I think that's what they're going to be using for Henry Ruggs. I don't think it's going to be a lot of, it's not a player that needs to be really technically sound is, is the way I look at Henry Ruggs. And that's why I see he has a path to success in my opinion. Yeah, I'm going to have to give this one a boot as well. I'm just giving 11 out of 10 <laughs> because every, any, any, anytime someone compares any player, any player to Tyreek Hill, that take is off my radar because I, I, just, I just don't draw comparisons to unicorns and Tyree Kill is a unicorn. I think I saw a tweet. I think too many unicorns, really well. Mike. We're living, we're, we're at the it's point where the past we questions. have a lot of unicorns now. Yeah, so. well, people got to stop talking about these unicorns, man, because <laughs> that's all I see. Because I think someone said on Twitter, they said Tyree Kill is like the modern day, like Randy Moss. And that's really how I kind of see it. He's like one of one. 
Uh, he's one of one in terms of like talent and ability. He's also one of one in terms of like situation and the fact that he's tied to Andy. Is there Reed. a player? Let me ask you this. If you put like the 12 best players on the field together, that was really ignorant. The 11 best players on the field <laughs> together, the 11 best players on the field together and Tyree kill is one of them. Is there any player in the NFL that a defensive coordinator game plans around besides Tyree kill? No, he is not, like no. the game plan for this guy team, is right? the, this guy breaks. This guy breaks your defense. Yeah, he like is the that should be his yeah. fucking nickname, the game plan. Because and I don't think it matters <laughs> anyway. Like, he just breaks for any defense he goes up against. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. doesn't matter. I don't that's just so, yeah. That so that's why I have this as a as a two fire of a take for me uh, when he draw the comparison to Cheetah. I mean, the twelve purpose, twelve all purpose touchdowns is just absolutely insane on top of nine hundred yards as well. But yeah, I'm gonna give this eleven out of ten. Yeah, I don't know how he came up with these projections, like 900 yards and then 12 touchdowns somehow. I don't, I don't understand that. I think the 900 is attainable because it's like a Debo Samuel type type of thing. He could have like 800 receiving yards, 100 rushing yards, or like 750 and 250 or 150. I think that's pretty easily attainable because, as as we talked about before, the AFC West you got to be pretty high powered nowadays. And if that just means throwing him like five slants a game and him taking one to the house every other week, he's gonna get to 900 yards pretty easily. He is very explosive, and for as much as we don't like his college profile because objectively it isn't good, I don't think he's a bad football player, and he definitely has that game-breaking speed that we saw at Alabama. So the 900 yards, I don't think he ever reached that <laughs> at any year in Alabama. So uh, that might be a little bit bold, but I'll give that part like a 7 and the rest of it like a 45. Sorry, I'm laughing at Scott's, uh, Scott's yeah. bowl take. Well, yeah. We got ba- we got bike-to-bike Dobbins bowl takes. We'll start with the MVB 1987. Dobbins takes the Baltimore backfield by week four, and Ingram is a complimentary piece. I'll put this at, at like a two because it's not something where you're like, J.K. Dobbins finishes as a top five running back or anything like that. This is a real – this is like the trajectory for most talented running backs. It takes a little while. It takes a month or two for the team to get comfortable giving them the rock enough to where they make whoever the veteran is in front of them the complimentary piece. So I would say this – yeah, this isn't a hot take whatsoever. I would almost say this is what I would safely project to happen there. Maybe it's a split, but uh, if, if Dobbins really balls out, breaks like one or two long runs in the first month of the season, I don't see how they keep him off the field for Ingram as a complimentary piece. Yeah, I would put it at like a four or five just because I think by week four, they're too good of a team to like have to really change too much up. So if Mark Ingram is working and J.K. Dobbins being like a complimentary, complimentary piece gets them to a 4-0 record by that point, even if he is like really dominant, I don't see them changing up too much. But I could definitely see it because I think at this point in Mark Ingram's career, I think J.K. Dobbins is the far better runner. Yeah, I, I'm going to give this a six uh, just because I think the week four is pretty aggressive. It's early, but, yeah. Uh, but I mean, by half season, like, you know, Miles Sanders-esque type of ascension, you know, I could totally see that happening. But it's a bold take. I like it because I, I have some Dobbins. I have him in the filet, filet league, so I'm happy to hear that. But, uh, yeah, I think just the week four is a little bit early for me. All right, Scott also wants to ride the Dobbins train. He said Dobbins will be first-round startup pick 2021. I know he wants to know the answer to this because he just keeps investing in Dobbins and DeAndre <laughs> Swift everywhere. He said ahead of Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, Ezekiel Elliott, and then he makes sure to tag at FB God, which is why I was laughing before because he never <laughs> drops a question or a statement without just throwing someone random at the end of it. So FB God, I mean, he fucking called you out. To the- I'd give that like a 15. answer the fucking man. <laughs> I, I'm giving it a 15 because I'm not going to let Scott win this one. I'm not trading for JK Dobbins. I don't believe in the talent. The guy, the guy low key stinks despite what I just said. Scott, if you send me an offer for JK Dobbins, I'm just not even going to decline it. It's going to sit there for however long it takes to be declined. <laughs> hold uh, on, hold on. I'm confused here because I don't know the I don't know the context behind uh behind what Scott's offering you. He's not offering me anything yet. He just wants to watch this episode and see what I'll say. So I'm not gonna give him that power. <laughs> okay. So will he be a first round set? Mike, you go ahead and answer and I'll read Yeah, look, I think the first round startup pick 2021 isn't that bold. I, you know, I think that's probably like a three or a four. I mean, Jonathan Taylor and CH are basically, you know, first round, second round startup picks. So if, if JK Dobbins succeeds to the second half of the season and we know that, you know, or we ha- we get some insight into like where Ingram is going like next year and he he's gonna become that workforce, I could easily see him becoming the top you know, first round starter pick um, in terms of who he goes ahead of, you know, cook and Zeke, I'd say that's probably, I mean, I think that's probably likely even not, you know, n- not even a, a bold take uh, Mixon and Chubb uh, again. It's like if, if, if cream hunt leaves Cleveland, I don't think you're going to take Dobbins ahead of Nick Chubb, but uh, you know, if Hunt stays or if something happens there, yeah, I could see that. Um, and then Mixon is all about this year, right? If Mixon has another down year, you could totally see him going ahead and Mixon, but if it Mixon becomes, if Mixon lives up to the hype that people like me believe that he can do, 
there's no chance that Dobbins takes him, uh, goes ahead and makes him next year. Yeah, I mean, if you look at – basically, I, the way I look at it is, like, if all of those running backs hit their ceilings this year, where are you going to be taking them in dynasty startup drafts next year? And it's like – I still would probably take Chubb and Mixon over Dobbins, assuming they all played out the year and they all, you know, did their thing expected of what they're supposed to do. So I, honestly, I don't, I don't think we're going to see Dobbins be a first round startup pick next year. I, he'll probably border on like the 12 to 16 range, assuming things go well and assuming Ingram kind of fades out after, uh, after this year, but ahead of Chubb, that's the one I probably have the most hesit hesitancy behind because there's a very, very high chance that Kareem Hunt's not there anymore. And giving Chubb the open backfield um, on any team is going to be a problem for most fantasy teams. So Chubb's probably ahead. Mixon, very dependent. Cook's probably going to fall behind Dobbins after this year, I'd assume. Um, but yeah, I would say I'd give it like a seven and a half or a lot, probably an eight because there's a lot of stipulations there. All right. X silent fire. Juju finishes outside of the top 24 wide receivers again and shows that he's not the real deal. Uh, I'll start off and say that's a nine, <laughs> an 8.8 .8 to nine in that range. I think that uh, Juju is absolutely the real deal. You don't do what he did in the NFL for the first two seasons at the age of uh, at the non-legal drinking age <laughs> and not be the real fucking deal. It was the, it was the second half of his rookie year. It was the entire year of his sophomore season and the dude was an absolute stud uh with big ben back he just needs a competent quarterback to be honest with you. He, he played most of the year injured he had quarterbacks who played like they were injured even though they weren't <laughs> injured and that was the problem for juju like you don't produce that prolifically and he was a dude that was like it, it wasn't lucky things man he, he's a he's a baller with the ball in his hands he's a yak machine he's a guy who can catch the ball all over the field he's got that slot position sewn up so it's easy targets it's easy receptions it's easy volume um, I see there's no way that he finishes outside the top 24 this year. I could understand if he, you know, kind of borderlines on that, like, top 15-ish and doesn't hit the ceiling that a lot of people wanted to see him hit, like, last year. Uh, but, no, I don't, I don't think this is uh, a fluky juju. Yeah, I put this at, like, a nine as well. Just because, as Nick said, like, you're not that efficient and you can't be that good with the ball in your hands after the catch without being good at football. And the main argument for Juju Smith-Schuster was, oh, he had a down year because Antonio Brown wasn't there and Antonio Brown helped him. The guy put up 1,400 yards with Antonio Brown there. If he wasn't good, they wouldn't be giving him 1,400 yards worth of production when you have Antonio Brown on the field with him. So I just think that he's way too talented. And as Nick said, like at such a young age, what he did in the NFL, his college profile, and the fact that last year he was dealing with, I believe, like a toe and like a core muscle injury, and he had no quarterbacks to play with. And the, the fact that like Deontay Johnson and James Washington stepped up, whereas Juju just kind of had like a roller coaster year throughout the entire season is what made him drop from basically a top two dynasty wide receiver to around number 10. I just think even to fall to wide receiver 24, if he has another down season, I think that's way too far of a fall for that to like realistically happen. Yeah. One more thing I want to throw in there too. And a lot of the people made points going into last year that, you know, without Antonio Brown there, Juju's going to have to operate on the outside. He's going to have to take on cornerback ones. And that's why people are like, Oh, he couldn't do it last year. That wasn't the case. He actually ran more snaps from the slot. He had a higher percentage of routes from the slot last year than he did two years ago with Antonio Brown on the field. So they didn't move him outside. That wasn't the problem. It was the injuries. It was injuries to Big Ben as well. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm kind of on board with you guys. I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10 just because I think Juju has already shown that he's a real deal. Someone that has produced that early, that prolifically, um, the fall off for someone like that is, is very rare. In fact, I can't even, I can't even think of one right now in my, in my head that someone that has done that and produced the way that he has and just became a bust to, uh, to go forward. I think last year there's just a lot of factors at play. Um, and I think that he probably, you know, I think he's, he's going to be a value, man. Like people that drafted him this year in startups in the third or fourth round are going to cash in because people are going to remember like how good of a receiver Juju Smith-Schuster really is. Yes, sir. Um, let's talk about another wide receiver who is probably being undervalued last year. We're going to combine both of these. Why would you put two Tyler Boyd bold predictions back, back to back? <laughs> That's how much I love him. I just put him back to back. So, <laughs> Ridiculous. Throw him easy so we're going to combine both together. of these. We have Silky Smooth and Andrew. We have Tyler Boyd has his third straight thousand yard season, hits the 1300 yard mark with big Joe Burrow in his bag. And then we got Tyler, Bar uh, Tyler Boyd gets the second most targets in the league, bringing himself into the low end wide receiver one range this year. I kind of love that second prediction, to be honest with you. While everyone's sleeping on him just as like a floor play, he just balls out and he's like, nah, that, that's not the case. Like I'm the real fucking deal here. Back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons, does he go over 1,000 yards again this year? I think he does. My one concern is like 
does this offense become a lot more balanced? Like, I don't think he's got that target number in him again, like anywhere near that. And he's not a playmaker enough on the field to rack up um, a high yardage total without those types of volume numbers. And last year, I believe Cincinnati ran the single most plays while trailing in the NFL, which obviously led to a lot of passing opportunities. They're going to be a better team this year. Uh, They're going to spread the ball out a lot this year. Tyler Boyd, I do expect him to be the number one target on the team in terms of overall targets. Uh, So I do see him hitting over a thousand yards. It wouldn't shock me if he went over like 1200, I think 1300 is probably pushing it. Um, But I want to see the man succeed. I do want to see him ball out a little bit and and show us a ceiling that people are not um, accounting for. What are you guys thinking here? Yeah, for third straight thousand yard season, I'm going to put that as a one. I just feel like for the next like eight years, he's locked into a thousand yards. 1300, as you said, I'll put that around like a five or six because, you know, the Bengals offense isn't great. Joe Burrow might struggle early on. I mean, they are in a division with the Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens, which are very good defenses, which could be four matchups a year that he could struggle in. Uh, So I'd put that around like a six or seven. And then getting the second most targets, I'll put that as a 10 because as long as Michael Thomas and Devontae Adams are in the league, I don't see him ever finishing top two. And then as a low end wide receiver one, I'll put that like a six or seven because two years ago with AJ Brown on the or AJ Green on the field for about half the season, he was a wide receiver 16. This past year, he's a wide receiver 21. But you also have to keep in mind the quarterbacks he was playing with, whether it was Jeff Driscoll, Andy Dalton, or Ryan Finley. Hopefully, Joe Burrow is better than all of those guys. But then again, there could be some rookie struggles out of him in that division. So uh, that one's a little bit more bold for me. But I think the thousand yards, he's just like one of the more safe investments you could make in the eighth round. Yeah, look, I, I love Tyler Boyd. And I think that 1,000 yard season is an absolute fucking lock. You can lock that shit up. It's definitely going to happen. Um, in terms of the 1,300 and the low end wide receiver one and the second most targets of the league, I think those are all those are all pretty spicy takes because, you know, I, I'm always shocked that when I look back at the stats and I see Tyler Boyd was seventh in the league in targets, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, when did that happen? Um, but, like, in terms of getting the second most targets in the league, like, Devontae Adams is literally. I think Devontae Adams is probably going to be the wide receiver one this year, if I'm being honest. And then Michael Thomas is obviously going to have a bunch of targets as well. So I don't really see that happening. Um, but, yeah, I think he's definitely a great investment, though. And you guys should definitely be locking him up. I think he's a great value. He always has been a great value. He will continue to be a great value. This is the younger Robert Woods that everyone should be looking for. Yeah, let's, uh, let's skip over to the next one. We'll come back to it. And while we're on Cincinnati, let's go with Silky Smooth's second bowl prediction. Oh, he went back-to-back. This guy's got to be a Cincinnati fan. <laughs> he went Tyler Boyd first. He also said Joe Burrow breaks the rookie yards and touchdown record. And I believe the rookie yardage record was set by Andrew Luck, 2012, 4,374 yards. Beast. Baker Mayfield uh, Baker Mayfield broke the passing record, right, with 28? 27. 27? Yep. Okay, so we have 43.74, and we have 27. That is a hefty stat line for a rookie. Uh, just saying that out loud, I'm going to have to err on the side of a, uh, a nine. But then again, this dude just smashed every college record that, he, that was put in front of him last year, and he's set up to succeed with an improved offensive line. He's set up to succeed with good weapons around him. I just think that's uh, – I, I could see him flirting with it, but probably more realistically, like 4,100 yards, maybe 20 two or 23 passing touchdowns um anything above that is you're probably playing with yourself yeah that is pretty bold i'll put that around like an eight or nine as well just because like those numbers don't seem too lofty but then you're like halfway through the season and joe burrow has like 11 touchdowns and nine picks you're like okay that 27 <laughs> is actually a lot so yeah. i i could understand this because their defense isn't great their run game they have joe mixon but they can't really run the ball well they invested in titty higgins so you expect them to throw a lot but again there could be some rookie struggles especially with a shortened off season. So. I think the 4,300, 4,400 yard mark is extremely lofty for him. I'd almost say like the 27 touchdowns is more attainable than the yardage for some reason. I don't know. That's just like how my I don't brain think their works. Team, I don't think their team is good enough to, to have yeah. a quarterback with 27 passing touchdowns. That, that is true as well. There's only four or four quarterbacks that did it last. Or actually there was like five or six, but all of them were like good, good offenses. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put this at a 7 only because I want to look back at like if anyone's like if Dalton has ever done this and Andy Dalton in his third year uh hit 40 hit about 4300 yards, 33 touchdowns but about 20 interceptions. So, assuming there's no stipulation on the on the interceptions here, you know, I could see a case where Joe Burrow hits like 4k yards uh total yards including rushing uh plus 27 touchdowns, but it, I think it's definitely a pretty spicy take. Uh, just because, you know, especially given the shortened season, I think, you know, something that's going to hit, you know, the quarterback probably more than any other position in terms of trying to pick up the playbook um, and getting those reps in with the receivers. 
Yes, sir. Another rookie. Another rookie. My favorite rookie, DeAndre Shifty Swifty, baby, from Jiggity Puff. I love that name, Jiggity Puff. DeAndre Swift is the offensive rookie of the year. Uh, I'm going to go with the 10, maybe a 15, because it's just <laughs> it's so hard to win the offensive rookie of the year as a running back. Even yeah. in years when you should win it, like last year, you don't win it. So DeAndre Swift is not going to win it. I, in my bold prediction video last week, I said that DeAndre Swift ends up as the number one fantasy scoring running back this year. And um, I think that people are buying into like the few games that Carryon Johnson had over the last few years that he was really good in, but they don't realize, I, I think like people are forgetting just how tantalizing of a prospect DeAndre Swift really is. Like he can play all three downs. He's got the size, he's got the speed, really good on third downs. Um, so I, I imagine that like DeAndre Swift actually becomes a bigger part of his backfield sooner than a guy like J.K. Dobbins and possibly just as fast as a guy like Jonathan Taylor does with that whole Naeem Hines and Marlon Mack thing. So I think the better bowl prediction would probably have been like the offensive rookie of the year sans quarterbacks, but it's almost impossible to, to top quarterbacks when it comes to this award. Yeah, I yeah. like your bold prediction because you brought up that like DeAndre Swift is the only rookie running back who outclasses the backup in basically every facet of the game, whether it be like Damian Williams and his breakaway runs and uh, Naheem Hines' pass catching or whatever. DeAndre Swift is just like a souped up version of Carryon Johnson. But as far as his bull take goes, I'm going to give it like a 15 as well because I think people are starting <laughs> to forget that Justin Herbert is a rookie and, he's a quarterback <laughs> and the chances of him winning the rookie of the year are extremely high. I would have put Justin Herbert take number one or a one because I completely agree with it. But that's not the world we live in right now. Did you see the, uh, you see my saw, bold prediction? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> Hell yeah. uh, I'm going to have to give this one a 10 out of 10 as well, just because, look, you, you really need an Alvin Kamara-like season. Uh, and that was a historic, historic rookie season, both from a, he's the greatest outlier from a running back position for fantasy, uh, for rookie production, you know, that we've seen in a long time. And I just don't see – Swift doing that just because not not because I don't think he's talented and you know if Swift had landed on the Kansas City Chiefs I would I would be all on board with this type of take but the fact of the matter is he landed on the Detroit Lions with Matt Patricia who still sticks a pencil in his ear even though he uses a fucking iPad uh, for his play calling so like that, that you just can't couple that with rookie of the year type of projections for me yeah fair enough fair enough all right Codine Codine young Codine what's up player Drew I don't think we can read this Drew Lock will finish. Yeah, you read this one. I know it hurts. Drew Lock will finish as the QB four. Uh, at, wait, read the rest of it. At Effie God. So I'm gonna pass over to Noah. How I want a prediction from you. One, if you think this is possible. Two, if it is possible, how many ACLs have to be torn ahead of him in order for this to in order for this to happen? I, any take that makes me wish ill upon like 34 <laughs> other quarterbacks is not a take I want to believe. So Drew Lock, this is like a 15 again for me. This guy stinks. I don't care if you animal. I hope you watch this episode. Drew Lock fucking stinks. I mean, I I told somebody in the comments the other day. There's only one AFC West quarterback that can pretend is good, and that's Justin Herbert. So I'm not out here <laughs> pretending that Drew Lock is anything. <laughs> Drew Lock, this is a lock. This is a lock. This is a one. <laughs> we can go into the negatives. I do it. No, this is ridiculous. So who is he beating out? He's not beating out Mahomes. He's not beating out Lamar Jackson. He's not beating out Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, Deshaun. This is fucking outrageous. You're trying to piss us <laughs> off. You're trying to make us yell, and it's working. I'm done. I'm done. All right, moving on. I'm going to literally uh, need some codeine after this. All right. Get schmucked, 70. Gardner Minshew will ball out, be a top 10 quarterback, and next year will remain the starter as they draft O-line in the first round. He will then be oh, – Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus. Paragraphs. I got to literally <laughs> scroll my Excel screen to the right. He will then become a top 10 dynasty quarterback as he becomes a Jags franchise quarterback. Holy shit, I've never said quarterback so many times. All right, uh, let's break this down into two things. So we've talked a lot about Gardner Minshew. We're all really big fans of Gardner Minshew 2020. The question becomes – is he an actual real-life NFL quarterback that the Jaguars franchise can build around, or is he just going to put up good statistical numbers this year? You know, you get what you can squeeze out of him in 2020, and then you kind of, you know, whatever. You, you had fun with him, and he's done with it. Uh, so Minshew will ball out be a top-10 quarterback. I think that's not too bold. I, I think that's realistic given the rushing ability he showed last year So and, and the passing volume that they're going to get again this year. I think that's maybe like a three out of 10 next year will remain the starter as they start to build around him is where it gets probably a little bit bolder because the reason he's going to get so much passing volume is because his team is going to be fucking terrible. So 
that means they're probably going to be in the quarterback lottery. I'd imagine teams are starting to learn that they need a quarterback in order to compete in the NFL. Uh, I, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble, as much as I like Minshew this year, getting on board with him as, as a, uh, a long-term option. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm there with you, Nick, as far as the redraft perspective goes, being a top 10 quarterback. I do love his rushing upside. I like the fact that they have no defense anymore and their running game stinks, so they're going to have to throw the ball. I, uh, I do think that next year, if they are like a top two or three pick, they're going to invest in either Justin Fields or Trevor, Trevor Lawrence. So that's basically a lock if they are that bad. And in the division that they're in with a few competitive teams and with how bad the Jaguars are, that seems to be somewhat realistic. But uh, if we're talking just like pure dynasty value, him going around like quarterback 25, I'm still fine pushing the button on him there because even if he does lose his job, I think somebody else will pay up for him because even the Chicago Bears traded to get Nick Foles this offseason. That guy's an absolute fraud. Go. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, look, I think I'm going to put this at an, as a nine just because I think there is a chance. Like if he does perform well enough and, and the Jags are sitting there at like first overall or, or second, I, I guess that's, that's, I guess that I kind of just like, contradict myself because there's no way he could perform well enough and the Jags still be sitting <laughs> yeah. at the first and second overall. So That's the mind. problem there. It's just yeah. like, it's a catch 22 and yeah. <laughs> nothing works out well in Gardner's favor. That's the yeah. Problem. So, so yeah, that, that's not going to work, but if he does perform well and they aren't in the top, top three picks um i could see a scenario where that plays out and, and he becomes like i'm not gonna say a franchise quarterback but he's gonna be given a longer leash to kind of like play out his rookie contract because having a quarterback at the rookie contract with a six round pick is just a massive massive uh advantage from a salary cap perspective yeah all right so that rips off all of the discord bowl predictions that we have if y'all want to get into the discord you can do so by joining our patreon patreon.com forward slash b d g e that's also where you'll be able to join uh, startup leagues with other bdge discord members we're going to be ripping off some redraft leagues starting at some point in august so if you're looking for good redraft leagues competitive redraft leagues paid redraft leagues pay that man this is where you can get that patreon.com slash b d g e uh, we are going to end this video with some bold predictions from us three. I'll start off, and uh, mine sticks in the AFC West, and it's about Noah's favorite tight end, Justin Herbert. All right, guys, that's this week's video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I, you can finish this, Nick, but I can't stand too much slander of this guy. No, I was just going to say that uh, – I forgot to put the ending to it. It's Justin Herbert converts to a tight end and catches 15 of Tyrod's 40 passing touchdowns this year. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Justin Herbert converts to tight end. I think we all agree that's a five. <laughs> no comment. No comment. Pay the man. <laughs> I don't have I a was disrespectful thing, enough for you to not capitalize his last name. And then just to say Tyra Tyler is going to throw 40 passes this year. Every <laughs> fucking device I have is auto lowercase. Like, you, I can't do a capital letter. <laughs> I spell running back yeah. as one word, so I have no room to talk. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> I can't believe you thought running back was one word. I've just been living a lie my whole life. <laughs> That's incredible. All right. Uh, uh, do you guys actually want to do any bold predictions? Like, Yeah, I got one. I got one for you. Um, so, look, my bold prediction, I try to keep it a little bit realistic and things that I think uh, can actually happen. Um, I'm, I'm like Nick. But uh, here, here's, I'll give you a couple of mine. Um, one is I think that Cam Akers will have a Miles Sanders-esque workhorse-type ascension towards the second half of the season, and he will be the first running back drafted in ADP, Dynasty ADP, next year out of this class. That's one. Two, I think Ryan Tannehill will finish – as a top eight fantasy quarterback this year. Love it. I'd actually want to double down on the DeAndre Swift take that we were talking about before. I do think DeAndre Swift's going to go into next year. I don't know if he'll be the top rookie running back. I'd imagine Jonathan Taylor will probably be the first uh, rookie to go off the board. But I would like to say that we're going to start looking at DeAndre Swift. A lot of people are going to start making comparisons from DeAndre Swift to Dalvin Cook and that ascension. And I think that's the way people are going to be looking at Swift next year. I think he's a, a really good bet to be a first-round uh, rookie pick going into 2021. So I'm going to, I'm going to double down and say that he does finish this year as the top scoring fantasy rookie running back, and he'll be the highest drafted one going into next year. I have right. one bull take. Mine is Hayden Hurst gets traded to the Oakland A's to become a pitcher in return for Billy Bean. 
You think that was gonna make me angry? <laughs> like you can't get an Atlanta Falcons. That too. You can't get an Atlanta Falcons fan anymore. Angry. <laughs> like we signed Todd motherfucking Gurley, all right? Like, I have no heart or soul remaining inside of me. Oh man. I'm done. All right, that's all, go- that's all, boys. Hope you guys enjoyed the bold takes. We'll be back at you with a lot more videos on the Bunk Bed channel. Make sure you subscribe. Like Nick said, make sure you join the goddamn Discord. If you're still doing drafts, make sure you buy the fucking guide because it's the best damn thing on the market. Just make sure you get all the value, and that is 100% the best value on the market today. We'll Justin be coming Herbert, out with uh, ADP one. soon as well, so make sure you guys be on the lookout for that. You know, July's coming to close. We've got a bunch of leagues closing, and I'll be crunching some Excel monkey numbers in the background. Oh, 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 oh,